Welcome to the closing event of the Week of Italian Cuisine in the World, an initiative coordinated by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, which celebrates its fourth edition this year. The aim of the Week of Italian uh, Cuisine in the World is not only to promote Italy's healthy cuisine and genuine products, but more in general, to enhance the awareness of the importance of healthy food culture and habits, food safety and food education. In this regard, for a number of lessons, Italy and what we call the Italian way of life no doubt enjoys a comparative advantage vis-a-vis -vis other countries. Tonight we will learn from our guest speaker, Professor Graziano Pinna, Department of Psychiatry, University of Illinois, Chicago, how important the way we eat is to, for our wellness and more in particular for our mental health. Professor Gazzano Pina, who is a close friend of the Council General of Italy in the Italian Cultural Institute in Chicago, will discuss how a healthy diet rich of fruit, vegetables, and fish can help fight and reduce the symptoms of depression. I know that this topic may be not so well timed on the eve of Thanksgiving, but let's, <laughs> but let's, not, let's all pledge at least until after the festive season to eat better, so to live better. And now, since we have this log, I would like to um, uh, introduce this uh, initiative. This initiative was launched by the American Foundation Save Venice with the Italian Embassy in Washington to, um, to express support and love towards Venice. And if you want to know more details about you can visit our website or the website of the Italian Cultural Institute. And now I'm very pleased with the floor to Professor Graziano Pina and I wish you all to enjoy this inspiring presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation uh, to speak here. And it's always really a brilliant honor and a privilege uh, to be here at the Italian Cultural Institute and uh, have an opportunity to present uh, uh, my work uh, uh, related to uh, psychiatry and uh, mood disorders. So today I will speak on how a healthy diet may improve your mood, and I will also introduce uh, uh, the microbiome role in improving the mood. So first of all, before starting my presentation, I have some disclosures. I served as a consultant for Marines Pharmaceutical, participated in uh, biomarker discovery for the axon during phase two <coughs> clinical trials in epilepsy and postpartum depression. And also I received support by Marino Pharmaceutical for a preclinical study of Ganaxolon. And the University of Illinois in Chicago has filed two patent applications were published in December 2018, one on PEA and PIPRA alpha agonist and one on allopenilolone analogs. And a reference of not always provided, but they are available upon request. Uh, the topic covering this presentation includes short and uh, long-term effect on uh, diet, on mood, and uh, I, will, I will speak of the concept of you are what you eat. Uh, can things you eat increase the risk of brain depression and alternatively can an healthy diet improve mood disorders? I will also uh, speak of the role of uh, neurosteroid in depression and anxiety associated with obesity and anorexia nervosa, and uh, what are the elements that improve your mood and why. Um, I will also introduce uh, the role of the microbiome and microbiome derived in neuromodulators, and uh, uh, I will speak on uh, developing uh, food derived strategies to treat mood disorder by stimulating neurosteroid target, uh, and also the role of uh, both the microbiome and brain TPARs. So I, by the end of my presentation, I hope that I can convince you that both TPARs and neurosteroids that right now are really very strange name and a familiar name for you, are mediators in the microbiome and brain trafficking and uh, thereby may provide uh, uh, may provide improvement of uh, uh, mood, uh, may also serve as uh, biomarkers to predict and treat uh, mood disorders. So probably um, if you uh, have uh, found yourself in uh, front of the television on the couch and uh, uh, digging on uh, an ice cream with a spoon on a bad day, probably you know how uh, food and mood are connected. And uh, the association of uh, food and mood uh, uh, has been uh, known for uh, many, a very long time. And uh, 
uh, and th th there are diver different associations that can be done. However, the relationship between the food and the mood disorder is less well known, and this is uh, a field of study that is just emerging in uh, uh, nutritional psychiatry. So good company, good food, they always go together, and so it's not difficult to imagine with being with your best friend, old friends, uh, and uh, catching up together with a nice and a good bottle of uh, wine. However, there is also uh, the consumption of uh, junk food uh, when uh, your mood is down, when you had a bad day, and so the consumption of food can make you immediately feel very good, uh, but not necessarily this feeling of well-being are um, maintained after a couple of hours. Probably after a couple of hours of eating a lot of junk food, you start to have some stomach ache and uh, feeling a little bit bad. So, uh, however, the consumption of uh, um, <laughs> this junk food is basically uh, making you feel better because uh, it is uh, activating all the reward uh, circuits of the brain. And they are quite complex and are also activated by drugs of abuse. And uh, so basically, uh, food addiction uh, of junk food really pretty much uh, involves the same areas of the brain, the ne same neurotransmitter. The symptoms are also pretty much the same. And uh, to try to understand how this circuitry really works, think about it. What would you give up first about these three items? Junk food, sex, Wi-Fi? Usually the answer is somewhat uh, sex dimorphic. The ladies usually pick junk food and Wi-Fi. The guys pick something else. <laughs> and uh, so addiction of uh, uh, food that make people feel like they, can, they really cannot resist uh, on uh, uh, the food uh, uh, addiction because uh, this is really driving the necessity to activate over and over this reward uh, uh, circuitry. So there is also another aspect. There is also the food, the good, healthy food that uh, may not make you feel really good in the moment you eat it, but may also uh, pay back in the long, in the long run. And uh, so the decision sometimes uh, is really very difficult, but uh, you know, in the long run, it's like a, a balance that you have to find about consumption of junk food that makes you happy in the moment and uh, eating very good food that can pay back in the future. So if you think about it, it's like a bank account. If you are eating good food, you're making a deposit toward uh, your nutritional level of what you're eating, and if you're eating junk food, it's like uh, a withdrawal nutritionally. And uh, so you have to keep a balance here. If you drink, uh, for example, uh, some aloe vera is like a deposit. If you are heating some bacon and potatoes, it's more like a withdrawal. So at the end of the day, you have to see the balance. And trust me, nobody is really perfect when it comes uh, to uh, uh, eating habits. And but at the end of the day, you are really what you eat. And for many people, uh, this uh, you are you are really what you eat. You know. It's relevant in the moment you are not feeling so well and you are uh, going towards the food to find uh, a mean of uh, uh, feeling good. So anxiety disorders and uh, consumption of food, they go hand in hand and uh, usually it's an, and uh, so is stress. Stress uh, is a, a, an environmental factor uh, that induces uh, behavioral deficit, including depression, anxiety. And usually uh, we believe uh, that anxiety disorder is what is triggering the consumption of food, of junk food, and so an eating disorder. So generally in the United States, there are almost 8 million of people uh, that have a, a, a co-occurring disorder. So where, for example, anxiety disorder is co-occurring with eating disorder. So a person that has anxiety disorder, uh, and where anxiety disorder generally even start uh, uh, during childhood, uh, uh, starts to eat uh, um, unhealthy food and uh, junk food to find also a mean of self-medication. That's also what happens in uh, anxiety disorder patients that start uh, to drink alcohol because they understand that drinking alcohol 
they can relax, they don't have the anxiety level too high. And so it's a form of a, a self-medication, but at the end you find in a vicious uh, cycle where you have a development of the addiction towards food or toward uh, alcohol. But the finding that food has the ability to improve the behavior, whether this is uh, activating reward mechanism or uh, whether it can make you feel good in the long run, establish a really very important connection about the food and uh, the behavioral modulation. So recently have emerged a number of uh, studies that have shown that food is actually works as a very good antidepressant because it's able to induce an improvement in behavior in the, in the uh, short term. So this is really uh, quite uh, uh, um, impressive because if you only think about the antidepressants that are uh, currently used, the SSRI antidepressants, you see beneficial effects only after three to six weeks. One, each two, two uh, patients, they take these uh, uh, drugs, don't respond to treatment. And so the fact that you can improve the behavior by taking care of your diet is really very impressive. And also the possibility that you can treat symptoms of anxiety and uh, depression in the short term is really very important. And this is the basic of the nutritional psychiatry. So one, one of the questions that I ask, and that's what is the focus of my presentation, is how can uh, healthy food improve uh, your mood in the short term? Also, usually people think uh, that food, uh, bad food, junk food uh, eaten in the moment in which you need it is not really gonna have uh, a big uh, problem in the long run because you believe that we need to eat healthy because in the long run this will pay back, but it's not only that, you know. So that allows you to make uh, some, uh, um, let's say, some wrong decision and uh, eat bad food in the moment. But you have also to think that indeed bad food can make you feel you bad right away because it can give you some problems. Uh, it can change your mood. It can uh, um, decrease uh, your, your uh, uh, mood tone and can also put you at risk of depression. On the other hand, if you take care of your uh, diet, you can change uh, your mood, you can improve your mood, and you can even improve your mental health. And we'll, I will talk about all these topics here. So first of all, I want to mention that uh, uh, an analysis of the uh, Global Burden Disease Study published in 2013 has shown that a study in 187 countries in 28 groups in 291 disease or disorders demonstrated that uh, <coughs> mental disorder and drug abuse are the most prevalent disorders and the, the leading cause of disability worldwide. Among all neuropsychiatric disorders, depression alone has the position five and it represents 40% of all neuropsychiatric disorder. So it's really very prevalent uh, disorder. So the link between diet and mental health goes both way, as I mentioned previously. If you have a mental issue, it may make it harder to eat well, or a poor diet may contribute to poor uh, mental health. And there are a number of uh, clinical studies, all these studies that we're gonna show it right now, uh, have been published from uh, 2014 up to today. And I've shown, for example, a meta-analysis of study in 10 countries suggests that di dietary pattern may contribute to depression. Another study from an association between depression and uh, diet rich in uh, sugar sweetened soft drink and refined grains. Long-term exposure to an unhealthy diet is also a risk factor for depression in a study that looked at almost 4,000 people and uh, an healthy diet was high in sugar and uh, processed food. <coughs> Another meta-analysis uh, suggests that high consumption of bread meat could be associated with risk in developing depression. And a study in 4,000 students in New Zealand found that high quality of diet was associated with a better mood, and uh, low quality diet was associated with a poor uh, um, um, mental health. 
So there is also a distinction between uh, mindful eating and emotional eating. Uh, eating uh, food uh, high in sugar to escape a bad mood is usually called emotional eating. Mindful eating is the opposite. Uh, is when you take your time, you eat slowly, um, without distraction, you savor the experience of the healthy food that you're eating. And in a review of uh, 21 studies of uh, mindful eating, 86% of the study reported less binge eating and less emotional eating with mindful practice. Also, people who ate junk food were 51% more likely to show depression. And the more the junk food they were eating, the more depressed they were feeling. So, now, what are the biochemical substrate of these forms of behavior? Uh, a couple of years ago, in collaboration uh, with uh, Karen Miller, a colleague from the Massachusetts General Hospital, we found that uh, women at the extreme of the weight spectrum, at the uh, low level of allocanielon, which is also called uh, allo, and uh, so allo, is uh, a metabolite, it's produced by progesterone, uh, and uh, it acts in a, a brain receptor which is called GABA, and this receptor is also a target of ansiolytic drugs. So it's really very important to make you feel more relaxed uh, and relax anxiety, and uh, so it's an anti-stress uh, uh, receptor. Uh, so we found that these women that were either obese or uh, had anorexia had lower level uh, of allocranialone, and so these women, uh, the condition of these women was also complicated by depression and anxiety disorder. So how is a low level of uh, allo linked to obesity and anorexia nervosa? So this will be a topic that I will discuss uh, during this presentation. However, what I want to point out right now is that we found low level of allocranial orientation with depression, with PTSD, in general with mood disorders. So to see that also women with anorexia nervosa and obesity have low levels of allo adds on to the picture that allocranial may play a really very important role in, the, uh, in mood disorders. So this also suggests that if we supplement allo or we give drugs that increase allo level, we are in a position in which we can treat mood disorder. But let's see a little bit what allo is. Allo is produced in adrenal glands and in donuts in the periphery, but also in the brain. In 1981, it was discovered, in fact, that the brain works as a gland on its own, and uh, neurons in the brain uh, produce uh, uh, allocranialone, these are pyramidal neurons. And this is the work of one of our PhD students, uh, Roberto Carlos, now is a scientist in Spain. And so he observed that uh, the enzyme that produces allocranialone, and so allocranialone is produced in pyramidal neurons in the mouse brain, and uh, also in pyramidal neurons of uh, the hippocampus, uh, uh, cortex, in uh, basolateral amygdala, so all brain regions that are very important in the motivation and emotional behavior. Same results were found in the human brain. Allopenial is also produced in the human brain, in the cortex. It plays really very important by activating this uh, GABA receptor. And uh, a GABA receptor, I mentioned before, is a really very important target, an anti-stress receptor. And so what ALO does, high level of ALO potentiate uh, this receptor action, and uh, by this mechanism also regulate emotional behavior. So this was also another study uh, from our lab where for the first time we uh, observed that the level of ALO are decrease in depressed patients that correlate with the severity of depressed uh, 
uh, symptoms, depressive symptoms. Same finding were found in the cortex, northern uh, uh, cortex of depressed patients. We found a decrease in the enzyme that produce allopreneurone. So altogether, we have this decrease of allo in uh, depression, in PTSD, in mood disorder in general, and also in obesity and anorexia, which is complicated by depressive and anxiety symptoms. So another condition in which allopregnolone is decreased in this um, postpartum depression, uh, which affect one in nine women worldwide. So this type of allopregnolone is uh, decreased by about 50% in the women that are trauma, uh, trauma exposed with uh, mood disorders and complicated by postpartum depression. So these levels about half during pregnancy and the uh, changes in allopreneurial start to emerge in the third trimester of pregnancy. That's also when symptoms of postpartum depression start to emerge. And during the postpartum pre uh, period, the level of allopreneur are one third the levels of uh, normal uh, subjects. And so, also in this case, this observation suggests that by supplementing allopreneur to these women with postpartum depression, we are able to take care of th this symptom. So this observation a few years ago was taken very seriously by a pharmaceutical company called Sage Pharmaceutical that run a number of uh, clinical studies, phase two, phase three, multi-site, randomized, double blind, and uh, showed the efficacy of allopregnolone in a postpartum depression, which led in March 2019 to the approval by the FDA of allopregnolone, mm -hmm. uh, also known in uh, commercially as Brexalone Surrey. So for, uh, very first treatment for a postpartum depression and this the fda has approved the first drug to treat postpartum depression today nbc5 sabrina santucci talked to a local mom who has struggled with that condition and about hopes that this new drug could be a game changer donna marie is mom to two adorable young girls but shortly after having her first baby she didn't feel like herself and as soon as we walked home uh, or walked in the front door of our house, I just, just started crying immediately. And I felt this wave of sadness that just wasn't, and it wasn't right. She spent weeks with the blinds drawn, suffering panic attacks and unable to leave her bedroom. Her OBGYN diagnosed her with postpartum depression. She was prescribed a traditional antidepressant that took weeks to work. There's just kind of a shame that this is supposed to be a great time in your life and you feel all these very strange thoughts and feelings. Now there is quick relief. The FDA approved the first drug for postpartum depression called Zolreso. It's given through a one-time IV infusion. We see improvement of the patients within hours. UIC's Dr. Graziano Pina has studied the drug's main ingredient and hormone for decades. He says there's less chance of relapse with the new treatment. The pharmacological effect was rapid and was long lasting. The drug does have a hefty price tag costing thousands of dollars. Despite this, Donna Marie is happy new moms have options. Don't be ashamed. Seek help. Tell someone what you're going through. Anybody. Sabrina Santucci, NBC5 News. Infusion of uh, allopregnolone in uh, these women with postpartum <coughs> depression at a clinical uh, uh, trials using uh, a pill form of allo uh, for the treatment of ma major depression has shown that by giving uh, allopregnolone orally and by increasing the brain of allopregnolone levels in patients that have decreased uh, the level of this uh, a neuromodulator results in improvement of the symptoms, more energy, better sleep. And uh, so what is the advantage of having uh, this uh, new treatment for uh, a mood disorder, for postpartum depression, for uh, depression? As I mentioned before, with a traditional antidepressant such as SRI, only about 50% of the patient respond. So think about it. If you have uh, a patient with severe depression, with suicidal ideation, and you have to wait uh, three to six weeks that this uh, uh, treatment with SSRI uh, um, works, and maybe 50% of them even doesn't respond to the treatment. Or if you have a mother that just 
uh, gave birth and has postpartum depression and suicidal ideation is not a person that you can send really home with a baby uh, with a risk of her uh, own life and the baby as well. Of course, these are most drastic uh, uh, condition. However, here we see that the brexalone treatment is superior to SSRI with a 70% efficacy. Treatment uh, results uh, uh, in improvement of symptoms that happens after hours from this treatment uh, and uh, persist long term. So after you stop the treatment, the, the good mood still persists over time as opposed to SSRI antidepressant that usually you have to uh, continue using for months and even years sometimes. Also, the relapse rate uh, with SSRI antidepressant is 20 to 80 percent and the brexalone is much lower, as you can see from this slide. So, in the search of uh, new targets in the brain or in the body of an individual that uh, can result in an increase of allopregnolone levels in my laboratory recently, we turn our attention to a, a nuclear receptor called PIPAR alpha, which is a family of uh, PIPAR uh, receptors, which is <coughs> modulated by endogenous <coughs> compounds, so substances that are produced in our body, including, for example, PEA, or also by fibrates. Fibrates are uh, already a uh, FDA approved drug for the treatment of high cholesterol levels. So if you treat uh, uh, rodents uh, with uh, uh, PA by activating PIPAR alpha, you have uh, an upregulation of enzymes and uh, uh, proteins that transport cholesterol in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So basically what this does is initiate uh, a um, cascade of events that results in increased level of allopregnolone. So uh, allopregnolone that is produced in higher amounts activate GABA receptor and uh, uh, so this activation of uh, GABA receptor induces an increase in the function of uh, GABA neurotransmission in the brain which results in ansiolytic uh, uh, effect. So of course once uh, uh, you find uh, uh, agents that are able to increase uh, uh, the level of uh, uh, this neurosteroid, that it's a good mood neurosteroid, is something really very important. But my opinion, uh, and uh, also seeing the effect of food and behavior that are really very encouraging, very promising, I uh, um, thought, how is it, whether it's possible to increase allo levels uh, by an healthy diet. So for example, think about it. You can give a healthy diet to a pregnant woman or a postpartum, a lactactin mother without affecting the life uh, uh, of uh, the baby. So um, how uh, important and which aliments can improve the mood and which aliments may potentially uh, uh, increase allo level. So in clinical study, Mediterranean food uh, has shown to have a much higher advantage over other diets in improving the mood. And so this is the pyramid of uh, uh, food. So as you see in the base, uh, shows uh, uh, bread and uh, uh, grain carbs uh, that are eaten in much higher quantities, and then uh, uh, veggies and fruits, and more you go up and less you have to eat. And so up to uh, red meat, that's <laughs> the less of all that you should eat. You can eat tons of uh, veggies and fruits, uh, eat the rainbow of veggies and fruits, that's uh, what uh, uh, it's always suggested. Fats, there are good and bad fats. Fats that are not all the same, that we have the saturated fats, the trans fat, usually these are the bad fats. These are uh, fats that are found, uh, for example, uh, in uh, uh, red meat or, or uh, 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 fatty diary, and, uh, um, and these are not very good because, uh, first of all, what they do, they increase cholesterol level. Uh, the saturated fat, they increase both good and bad cholesterol. Trans fat, they increase bad cholesterol and decrease good cholesterol. Monosaturated uh, fats, instead of uh, uh, good one, good fats, they 
and increase the level of good cholesterol, polyunsaturated uh, fat, they are even better, and uh, they have a really beneficial effects uh, on uh, uh, the level of uh, cholesterol. So there are five foods that are really very important to fight high cholesterol levels, and for example, oats, beans, and nuts, uh, and fatty fish, uh, like salmon, uh, spinach, and polyunsaturated <coughs> fat, as I mentioned previously, fat is not all the same, and there are several myths about fat. Uh, so not all fat raise cholesterol levels, not all fat uh, uh, um, need to be uh, cut from uh, diets, or not all fat are created equal, and not all oil are the same. So polyunsaturated fats also give rise to uh, an increased uh, level of uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acid because these omega-3 fatty acids are uh, contained uh, in a lot of these aliments. So generally, there is a distinction between omega-3 and omega-6. Omega-3 are the good ones, and omega-6 uh, are the bad ones. One are anti-inflammatory uh, and anti-thrombotic, the other one are pro-inflammatory. And uh, also clinical studies have evaluated the efficacy of these uh, omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, for example, in depressed patient, young individual has shown that uh, 12 weeks of omega-3 uh, uh, alone, or, or together with psychotherapy, or psychotherapy alone, or just placebo, showed that 77% mm -hmm. who received psychotherapy and omega-3 uh, achieved uh, a remission as uh, compared with 56% who just received uh, placebo. Um, another study that was conducted by one of uh, our colleagues, uh, John Davis, has shown that uh, 12 weeks of treatment with omega-3, uh, we have a significant uh, greater improvement in the score of depression uh, and suicidality. Uh, and uh, daily stress. Uh, other uh, parameters, including um, impulsivity and aggression and hostility, did not uh, differ. So it's quite well established that Mediterranean diet uh, has uh, been linked to improve cognition and uh, reduce risk of uh, uh, dementia. And, uh, and there are a number of uh, clinical studies that have evaluated uh, the effect of, of uh, Mediterranean diet, which is rich in fruits, uh, vegetables, olive oil, uh, grains, lean proteins, from chicken and fish mostly. And uh, so a diet of this kind in 12 weeks improved mood and anxiety. Also a meta-analysis that included 46,000 participants in clinical trials uh, show that the diet improved uh, mood uh, and in normal, in normal uh, uh, individuals, but also improved depression and anxiety in patients with anxiety and depression. And another, another longitudinal study in about 12,000 individuals also showed that consumption of fruit and veg veggies uh, increased the well-being and happiness. Of course, we are talking about fresh fruit and fried veggies, not the one that you get from the can that really doesn't work for this. So the psychological improvement in this case was like similar to passing from a situation of employment to finding a job. Young adults uh, with depression and uh, unhealthy diet uh, also uh, significantly improved uh, the symptoms of depression after changing their diet. So this study was published just a few weeks ago, a month ago, uh, and uh, and they target the young individuals, they usually don't take care about so much about uh, uh, their diet, and so left uh, a group of control receiving their, their usual diet, and in another group they completely changed their diet, and so they saw a big improvement uh, of uh, um, symptoms. So now, How can you improve your mood with a healthy diet and why? So this um, question takes me to explore uh, the microbiome. The microbiome uh, consists of trillions of uh, microorganisms and uh, uh, thousands of uh, different species and uh, philia that are in our guts. 
and uh, so they coexist just to understand how uh, these atoms just make a, a really a busy city on a weekdays with people rushing to work and uh, or going to appointments. So in the micro microscopic level, this is basically what is happening in your guts with different population of bacteria that are there for many different reasons. And one of the things that really people are uh, 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 expert in the field of the microbiome agree is that the diet is the number one factor that improves uh, um, the uh, gut microbiome and uh, uh, the health of uh, the microbiome. Uh, also, um, so the, the, the food, the healthy food, is something really very important to keep a microbiome really healthy. So uh, all these uh, uh, microbiome form a different population of uh, a bacteria they coexist, and they are not only bacteria, there are also viruses, there are uh, parasites, uh, and they have several functions, they have anti inflammatory function, and regulate uh, uh, um, different function in uh, the body of an individual. So, but again, this uh, population are the good bacteria, but also there are a lot of bad bacteria. And the good bacteria usually are fed and they reproduce and they are uh, much uh, more increased uh, by good food. And the bad ones instead are uh, generally <coughs> elevated and take the, the dominance of the good bacteria by junk food. Again, these are microscopic uh, features of all the, uh, this bacteria and, uh, and gut <coughs> microbiome. And uh, so stress also has an effect in all this population of uh, bacteria. Uh, for example, in animal studies uh, uh, using the unpredictable stress, which is a series of uh, uh, physical and uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, stress, uh, which uh, include the restraint stress and forcing stress, stress uh, as shown that uh, uh, population including lactobacterial, uh, which is a, a positive and a good bacteria of the microbiome, are decreased. And uh, so this uh, um, decrease is associated with anxiety, depression, and despair behavior. And uh, so when uh, uh, these mice were treated uh, with lactobacteria to re-increase uh, this population in the gut, also the behavior was uh, improved. As evidence, the stress is really fundamental a big uh, uh, effect on uh, bacterial population. So, how can all these bacteria uh, have an effect on behavior of uh, our organism and uh, uh, regulate the several function and even uh, reach to the brain and uh, have uh, an effect with uh, even our power of uh, uh, behavior, emotionality, and even uh, decision making at uh, some point. So let's look uh, a little bit closer at uh, the microbiome. So um, we have uh, in immuno cells uh, that uh, mediate, uh, produ produce uh, cytokines, cytokines that can travel and reach to the brain and have uh, uh, pro anti inflammatory. Uh, effects, or we have uh, enteroendocrine cells. Uh, these enteroendocrine cells are also really very important uh, uh, for uh, because they make uh, a signal uh, travel through the vagus nerve and reach the brain. So this is another way how the gut microbiome is able to communicate with the brain. Another way is the production of uh, metabolites. Metabolites includes also uh, neurohormones, neurotransmitters such as uh, GABA, uh, norepinephrine, nephrine, uh, dopamine, and serotonin uh, that are produced by the microbiome and have a chance to reach the brain and affect uh, uh, behavior and emotions in the brain. So we also have this side chain uh, fatty acids such as uh, propionate, uh, butyrate, uh, that are also a really very important uh, effect. Uh, and that's what I will focus on right now. So now here we have uh, the good bacteria in green and the bad bacteria in uh, red. 
And so the good bacteria, as you see, produces a number of these short chain fatty acids. So you also see this is the epithelium, so the skin, the internal skin of the uh, intestine. And uh, so you may recognize a receptor that became a little bit more familiar to you right now, the PIPA receptor. So what this uh, good bacterial does produces all this uh, short chain fatty acid that go to activate the uh, PIPAR alpha and gamma. Gamma is basically in the family of the PIPAR alpha. And so what uh, this uh, short chain fatty acid do is uh, uh, stimulate the uh, PIPAR and uh, increase uh, uh, anti-inflammatory molecules that activate uh, um, anti-inflammatory cells which have the chance to fight back uh, bacteria that are stimulated by uh, unhealthy diet and uh, also uh, something that is not still observed. But do you remember that I showed you that PIPAR alpha activation increases in the brain allopranial alone? So now the fact that PIPAR alpha is also in the intestine, in the gut, suggests that activation of this receptor can also increase allopranial alone. So this was not uh, discovered yet, and we hope, my lab hopes that we can publish uh, this and uh, this observation. Also, allocranialone has very important anti-inflammatory actions. Uh, so uh, it's likely that by activation of this receptor with a short chain fatty acid, uh, not only you have uh, a uh, reduction of uh, inflammation, you have also the possibility to modulate the uh, um, emotional uh, the mood and uh, also to have uh, an effect by fight, fighting, fighting these uh, bacteria that are responsible uh, for uh, inflammation and also for uh, increase uh, of uh, adipose tissue. And in fact, there is uh, a very tight connection between inflammation, depression, and adiposity. So depression leads to increased uh, weight and adiposity and vice versa. And uh, inflammation is a common mediator. So uh, chronic uh, inflammation can occur as a result of a number of environmental insults, and it's uh, particularly common in uh, obesity. And so let's see how these mechanisms can act on the level of the microbiome. So again, we have uh, these bacteria that are in population that are increased by high-fat diets, so typical Western diets. And so they produce molecule that increase and feed up the, uh, um, the accumulation of fat because uh, by inhibiting a PIPAR gamma receptor, they stimulate enzymes that convert uh, and favor the accumulation of, uh, <clears throat> of fat. So on the other hand, they also have an effect on the integrity of uh, uh, cells in the intestine. And uh, um, so have a really uh, very bad uh, effect by increasing uh, blocking PIPAR alpha, also the increased inflammation and uh, and also have an effect, most likely, we didn't uh, observe that, so this is also something <clears throat> that my lab is looking into, is whether uh, blocking uh, PIR gamma with a, a fatty diet, with a, 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 an healthy diet, we also induce a decrease of allopranilone level by, because this has an effect, uh, a deleterious effect on uh, PIPAR gamma. So how can this be reversed? So here now you start to see why good diet and bad diet have an effect on mood and uh, body shape. So if when we eat high fat diet, we have all these uh, uh, symptoms and when you have a healthy diet, instead of, you have the possibility of reactivating PIPAR gamma so activation of PIPA gamma stimulate the enzyme that decrease and metabolize the fat, catabolize the fats and destroy the fats and so you don't have an accumula accumulation of the fat. Although this has not been observed yet, it's conceivable that by activation of PIPA alpha, by 
the good bacteria production of short chain uh, fatty acid, you have an increase of allopregnelanone that is signal to the brain and, and improves uh, uh, your mood. So how can we do that? We can do that with a diet, avoiding this diet and favoring an healthy diet. So that gives you a better body shape and also increases uh, and improves uh, uh, your mood. So something really very interesting, a couple of weeks ago, uh, came up, this, uh, was published this uh, clinical trial showing that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, including ibuprofen, Advil, aspirin, but also omega-3 uh, fatty acids had a really prominent antidepressant effect, rapid uh, effect, superior to traditional antidepressants, and uh, guess where these non-steroidal antidepressant uh, drugs act? Pipargamma. So this adds to the picture that activating pipargamma could be really a very important mediator in the modulation of mood. So what are, uh, the, what are herbs or aliments uh, that contain molecules that can uh, activate uh, pipars? A number of them, for example, um, and you can see here, we have uh, the um, uh, glycine uh, max and uh, cannabis sativa. Again, cannabis sativa is really very uh, prominent in the field for the treatment of uh, mood disorder. Cannabis sativa has two main ingredients, active uh, compounds. One is THC, as one is CBD. So CBD, I'm sure that most of you have heard about this molecule as improving the mood. Do you know where CBD acts in the brain? Which receptor acts in the brain? It's all over the brain. What's that? The CBD receptors are all over the brain. Yeah, what are they named? Yeah, <laughs> yeah they, are, they are all over the brain, I agree with that. But what is the name? Cannabinoid. That's an endocannabinoid, the receptor. I'm talking about the receptor. Huh? <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, Can I, uh, CBD, CBD acts on people gamma also. So, <laughs> yeah, anandamide is another endocannabinoid, and anandamide also acts on people alpha. So, you know, sometimes, and that's what we are trying to work on, there are two different receptors. Endocannabinoid receptor, uh, cannabinoid receptor type 1, CB1, and PPAR. So H THC works on CB1 and cannabidiol works on PPAR. So when you activate CB1, you have the effect of feeling stoned, or that is typical from weed, but activation of PPAR by CBD is ansiolytic and you don't feel stoned. So this is the best antidepressant that you can have in the field. And I'm not surprised that CBD is uh, in such a large diffusion for a treatment of mood disorder. So what are other approaches that you can have for improvement of your mood by taking care of uh, uh, your diet? There are a number of uh, uh, food rich in fiber and fiber enhance the population of this bacteria. Uh, for example, broccoli, bananas, uh, beans, and uh, blueberries, and uh, blueberries also activate piper alpha. And uh, so a number of uh, these uh, uh, food have the effect of providing fibers. And when uh, you eat these fibers, the population of these bacteria are enhanced and grow the good bacteria. And uh, so this is the prebiotic uh, treatment. But there is also the probiotic treatment. And the probiotic treatment uh, has already been evaluated in a number of uh, uh, clinical trials and uh, improves the mood, improves the creation, and uh, may also increase the level of uh, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. <laughs> there is a molecule that increases the trophism of the brain, which is also in the base and one of the mechanisms of the antidepressant effect of uh, antidepressants. So as you see here again, prebiotics or probiotic includes uh, the uh, population of this good bacteria that provide the short chain and fatty acid that activate uh, PPAR alpha, decrease inflammation, 
and uh, decrease uh, uh, fat accumulation and uh, improve mood. Uh, and you know, as I said, we hope to find that uh, allopranilol is involved, uh, microbiome allopranilol is involved because we already have published that allopranilol is involved uh, at the level of the brain after activation of uh, uh, PIPAR receptor. So <coughs> other measures that can be taken is the fecal uh, microbiota uh, transplantation. And so this uh, transplantation actually has shown to be extremely successful in treating a number of uh, disorders, including neuropsychiatric disorder, autoimmune disease, uh, allergic disorder, tumors, and originally, and it's still done uh, uh, using uh, this procedure uh, with an endoscopy uh, from an healthy donor, a fecal uh, donor, uh, and uh, but now it's also available on a capsule, and there is a currently clinical trial that is evaluating uh, the efficacy of uh, oral capsule of, uh, obtained with material from uh, uh, healthy uh, donor fecal sample. So the effect here again is to decrease and to, to fight the bad bacteria by upregulating, uh, increasing, in other terms, the population of good bacteria in uh, the gut. And so this is a really uh, um, interesting and very successful uh, uh, treatment. So other ways that you can do it with physical exercise, working out regularly, taking care of the uh, diet, but also working out is a really very important component that's been shown. Uh, to increase uh, and upregulate uh, the microbiota uh, composition. And um, um, very interesting, uh, we have uh, shown that allopregnenol level are decreased in uh, male uh, patient with PTSD in a manner that uh, correlate with the uh, increased severity of symptoms in these patients. And when we put this P PTSD a patient uh, to extensive physical exercise, these were soldiers with uh, PTSD, we found an increase in the level of allopregnelone that also fits very well with a feature of activation, increased in uh, population of good <coughs> bacteria, activation of PIPAR receptor, and increase in uh, allopregnelone level. So all these, uh, data together suggest uh, a couple of things. One is that all these deficit could be used as biomarkers, and uh, also that it's possible to develop a neurosteroid-based precision medicine. And as you know, psychiatry is a field that has suffered for the lack of uh, uh, biomarkers. Um, basically, virtually all field of medicine relies on biomarkers except in uh, psychiatry. And this is because uh, uh, biomarker in psychiatry pose really very uh, important challenges, uh, such as the fact that psychiatry conditions are poorly understood, and there is a co uh, there is an overlapping in symptoms. So sometimes it's also difficult to understand and make a precise diagnosis of the patient. But also there is an overlapping in symptoms with different uh, uh, pathology. For example. Uh, depression uh, can be co-occurring with anxiety disorder, with alcohol use disorder, uh, with post-traumatic stress disorder, and there are people that have likely all of this uh, pathology together and even uh, substance uh, use disorder. So to try and develop uh, um, mean to um, come up with biomarkers for uh, uh, psychiatry in my laboratory in Specifically, uh, we have uh, developed uh, methods uh, uh, to measure this neurosteroid uh, in the brain. It's called gas chromatography mass spectrometry. We have measured this neurosteroid in a number of samples, both for human and animal models in saliva, serum, plasma, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, in post-mortem brain. We collaborate with a number of uh, uh, university in the United States, and we have examined a number of pathology, including obesity, as we have seen depression, alcohol addiction, PTSD, epilepsy, and even perceived social isolation. 
And uh, so now, uh, with new funding that we receive from the Department of Defense, we want to develop uh, a, a technology uh, based on uh, uh, GCMS, where we can measure both endocannabinoid and neurosteroid in the same sample, given that these two molecules are related by the activation of PPAR receptor. We recently developed a method to measure neurosteroid in saliva, and why is this important? It's important because when you want to measure biomarker for a disorder and you're stressed patient, the traumatized patient with PTSD, anxiety, or depression, it's much better rather than putting in the needle in the arm by measuring these substances in uh, the saliva or even in the stool. <laughs> and in fact, the book uh, has really a lot of secrets on how mood <laughs> can now be evaluated as much as can make you laugh is really the future in uh, diagnosis uh, uh, and probably uh, most likely uh, finding biomarkers that can reflect uh, a brain condition and uh, also uh, condition that affect uh, uh, mood disorders. So um, biomarkers uh, in for psychiatry cannot be just one or a couple of biomarkers uh, because uh, of all these uh, problems that I mentioned to you before with the comorbidity and uh, with overlap of symptoms. So in my lab, we thought about this approach of creating a biomarker axis, where rather than just looking at single isolated biomarker, we look at the relation of them. For example, how the uh, PEA and PPAR alpha uh, um, uh, expression or, or uh, 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 endogenous level of this substance related to the production of uh, neurosteroid or allopinylone, the enzyme, the protein, all they all relate and fuse together uh, to form and, uh, and enable us uh, to produce a construct, a biomarker axis that in the long run can help uh, develop a precision medicine for uh, mood uh, uh, disorders. And again, in the long run, we hope that we will be able to develop uh, uh, diagnostic uh, tests by uh, correlating changes in the brain uh, with saliva, serum, and uh, stool of patients with uh, mood disorders, and by analyzing all this number of protein and receptor and uh, metabolite uh, in brain and how they relate with uh, the stool composition of uh, these metabolites. So uh, finally, the take home uh, message is uh, that diet uh, reduce the risk of depression, a good diet, and uh, a healthy diet can even improve the mood and can improve uh, symptoms. Not only, not only can elevate the mood of normal people, but it can really uh, efficiently improve symptoms of anxiety and depression. Neurosteroids that are reduced in depression anxiety disorders are associated with obesity and anorexia complicated by depression. And uh, the microbiome and microbiome derived neuromodulators play, play, play a key role in depression. And so strategies to treat mood disorder by stimulating neurosteroid targets, including the PPAR, offer a really uh, important uh, a strategy to uh, treat this uh, disorder. So, PIPARS and neurosteroids are mood mediators, are found in the microbiome, in the brain, are important for the communication about the microbiome and brain, and may also provide the biomarkers uh, suitable to predict and treat the mood disorder. So, uh, I have uh, to acknowledge uh, the uh, hard work all, all many components from uh, uh, my lab uh, in different years. We have uh, uh, two new members, Michele Tufano, that actually was uh, at the, uh, the gold hands that <laughs> helped to, to make this uh, uh, projector work. Uh, Raquel, uh, also she uh, came from uh, Spain to, uh, to my lab after a video working in Canada. Uh, Francesco Matriciano is also uh, uh, has a degree in uh, functional food and, uh, and many others uh, the, through the year, the two Brazilian, uh, Leandro and Mauricio, um, Roberto Carlos from Spain, uh, 
Andrea Lucci from Italy. Uh, so I really to thank them and the many, many collaboration that I had during these years and also from uh, UIC, some of them are also in the audience uh, such as Pauline and also in the audience we had uh, uh, Sandro Guidotti uh, who is a pioneer in the uh, field of uh, neurosteroid, is the scientific director of the Psychiatric Institute and I have really to specially thank him because it made me like so uh, inspired me and made me so passionate about this work on neurosteroids that having unexpected uh, development also with a microbiome that is making me really very excited. And uh, for sure I have to thank uh, Dr. Costa who uh, has been uh, as, as, as been, is seen from many as uh, one of the federal modern neuroscience published from 1947 until uh, two, 2009, so for a period of about uh, 62 years. So he has seen the development of the field of neuroscience in an incredible way. Neuroscience used to be a, a very, very small field. Like now it's an incredible expanded field and he made incredible discovery, including also uh, and together with Dr. Guidotti, uh, discovering the mechanism of actual vanceuritic benzodiazepine. And, and he has published over 1,000 uh, papers, and he was a member of the National Academy of Science. So we have the 10th anniversary of this that I worked with him. I had really the honor to work with him for 10 years. And uh, um, so this is. Uh, uh, really, uh, I feel very fortunate that I did this uh, opportunity to work with him. So thank you very much, and uh, sorry for the problems. And <laughs>